Have you ever had somebody tell you a bizarre story of coincidence and say, maybe somewhere toward the end, you can't make this stuff up? Uh, I was uh, at an orthopedic surgeon's uh, office re recently because I'm having little shoulder issues, and uh, he lives in our neighborhood. And I said, I, I heard a couple of years ago you uh, got robbed taking your trash out in, in the driveway. He goes, I got a story for you. He said, yeah, that happened on X date. I can't remember the date he gave me. And he said uh, that they, these two guys jumped me. They took me in the house. They stole a whole bunch of stuff, but they didn't hurt me. And he said, and I'm still here. And then they caught him later, and they're going to be indicted. But he goes, let me tell you another story you didn't ask me about. Exactly a year later, on the very same day, it's 2 in the morning. My doorbell starts ringing, 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 ringing. And he said, I'm thinking I'm in another bad situation. And he said, I go to the door. I look out the people. I can't see anybody. Finally, I open the door because i got to figure it out. And he said, there's a, a young man standing stark naked in the dark. And he's telling me that somebody robbed their house around the corner and his mom and dad had been killed and that he got, escaped. He found out later that the son, that, that boy was having a psychotic episode. But he said, when the next date came, a year later, we were bracing ourselves and nothing ever happened that day. And then he said, you cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> it's just coincidence. I found a couple others like that. Some of the, these, these uh, you may have heard, but uh, I just want to share a couple with you. It's called the Phantom Car Crash. On December 11, 2002, two motorists called police to report seeing a car veering off of A3 Trunk Road in England with headlights blazing near a town called Surrey. 2002. A thorough search uncovered a car concealed in dense undergrowth and the long dead driver outside the car nearby. It turned out that the crash had actually happened five months earlier when the driver, Christopher Chandler, had been reported missing by his brother. Two people said they saw a car careen off the road and it really didn't. You can't make that stuff up, right? Another one. Laura Buxton released a helium balloon uh, filled with, uh, I mean, a balloon filled with helium during celebrations for her grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary in Staffordshire, England, in June 2001. Attached to the balloon was her name and address. Remember, her name was Laura Buxton. And a note that said, if you find this, mail me a letter. Ten days later, she received a letter. The balloon had been found by another Laura Buxton. What? In the garden hedge of her home in Wiltshire, 140 miles away. Both of the Lauras decided, their families, that they meet each other. They're both 10 years old. Both had three-year-old black Labradors, a guinea pig, and a rabbit. And they both had pigtails and were wearing a pink blouse and blue jeans when they met. You can't make that stuff up. You hear that? It's just hard to forget, right? That's why it gets out there and gets put in the Internet so you can find it and read it. The vi one more. The village of... I'm not going to say it right, Caneto di Caronia in Cilicia's north coast, so over by Italy, a village on the coast has been plagued with mysterious fires. The trouble began in January 20, 2004, when a TV caught fire. Can you imagine your TV just catching fire? Then things in the neighborhood houses began to burn, including washing machines, mobile phones, mattresses, chairs, and even the insulation on water pipes. The electricity company cut off all power, as did the railway company, but the fires continued. Experts of all kinds carried out tests, but no explanation was found. The village was evacuated in February 2004, but when people returned in March, the fires resumed. Police ruled out a pyromaniac after they saw wires bursting into flame. You cannot make that stuff up. So we, we hear those stories, and uh, they're, they're riveting, aren't they? Well, actually, the story of Jesus through the prophecy of Micah being born in Bethlehem is just as riveting. But here's my fear, and this is what I want to stick in your heart for your pleasure and your peace that the 
our Christmas has become so celebrated for so long in so many different ways that we lose sight of how riveting and fantastic you cannot make this stuff up that the Christ was born in Bethlehem really is. You know, wrapping presents the other night for two or three hours, watching Lifetime like uh, shows like they're kind of like Hallmark movies over and over and over again. There's a, we, do you watch those at Christmas time? Are you watching some of those shows? Everything's about the meaning of Christmas, but because it's a secular presentation in every single film, this meaning's not there. This is the story that's so fantastic, you can't make it up. And we get so into Christmas, don't we? I mean, our family is coming. My family's coming. We're excited about it. The presents are under the tree now. But it's not the best part. It's not the riveting part. And we look at that mystique that we try to invent ourselves when the mystique is right in front of us. 700 years. Count them before Christ was born. Micah, a real man, with a, and, and his writings were really there for 700 years in a book that the Jews had, said that he's, this, this Messiah that's coming is going to be born six miles south of Jerusalem in Bethlehem. And here's the passage. Now, before we read it, Micah's prophecy, it's only a few chapters long. You could go home today and you can read it in one sitting. Put in some soft music and just read it. You could probably read it in about 30 minutes. Micah's prophecy was tough. He was, at the, he was at Israel at the same time as Isaiah, and they both had a tough message. You're leaving God, and so God is going to discipline you. And there's going to be wave upon wave of, of invasion and persecution, but God's heart is still with you. He's, he's like the, the, the Lindemans were when their grandchild had to cry in the room. It's good for you to go to sleep. God said, it's good for you to come to repentance. I'm going to close the door and let them invade you. Imagine being the prophet of God's chosen people to bring a beautiful message to bring people back to God, and you're walking around the streets preaching gloom and doom like that. He was not popular. But it was the truth. And in the middle, sprinkled throughout Micah, are these, God's got tender mercy for you. He's a loving father. And this is one of those passages. In the middle of the invasion is coming. And here we go. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. In other words, while all this bad stuff is coming, I'm going to raise up a ruler who will be born in Bethlehem. You know when you watch the Olympics or you're watching a sporting event, like right now we're doing all the bowl games, and like last night, for a few minutes, I got to see the beginning of the New Orleans Bowl, and uh, they were st one of the big story was the father, son, coach, and quarterback, and he got to play for his dad for four years in college football in the little town that they're originally from. You like stories like that when you hear about an athlete that starts small and ends up big. Well, again, human beings aren't the ones to create that first. God is. I'm going to put my son in a little place called Bethlehem. And he's going to be the one who comes from heaven, whose origins are from of old. But he's going to be born in that little place right there, and 700 years before it happened, that's when he said it was going to happen there. Now, real quickly, Bethlehem has a story in the Bible, but not a story in the world that's very big otherwise. Ha have you ever wondered, what is this word Ephrathah? Well, now you will, because <laughs> I'm making you wonder about it. You, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. You hear the word Bethlehem, O little town of Ephrathah. You don't ever sing that, right? Oh, little town of Bethlehem. What is Ephrathah? Well, we kind of hardly know. It, it says, since you're the smallest among the clans of Judah, this is the best guess, and I think it's true. Ephrath was a, a name of a man who had a clan in the tribe of Judah. He had a clan 
and that clan settled there, and the town of Bethlehem was created. But you know, when there's lists of tribes and clans before this verse in the Bible, Ephrath is never mentioned. It's another part of that no-name background of Jesus where he comes into that small place. But it appears in the book of Ruth, in the middle of the Old Testament history, where Boaz, this man who brings the Moabite Ruth into his life and rescues her and her mother-in-law, who's a Jew, Naomi, he is in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, the region of the clan that has a town called Bethlehem. That happened hundreds of years before this passage. So when Micah says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, he is a true Bible teacher, like I'm trying to connect things for you today. He's connecting his prophecy, inspired by God, back to Boaz. And Boaz is an ancestor of famous David. And that's why Bethlehem is called the town of David. And that's why Jesus comes from Judah, comes from Boaz, comes from David. And that's why when Caesar Augustus made a decree that all the world should be taxed, and, he's, and, and Mary and Joseph went, remember the words? They went to what? They went to Bethlehem because they were what? Of the house and line of David. This prophecy pointing to Bethlehem is also pointing to David and saying that Jesus was a descendant of David. Now, just real quickly, pull your hair. Why? What's the meaning of this? Why is God telling us all of this? So you will have God instead of all the... I'm going to be real critical. All the shallow messages of Lifetime and Hallmark movies that come at the end of that sappy love story. You will have God when you hear the riveting story that you cannot make up. It came from heaven itself. God came to Bethlehem in the very city that he would be born in was prophesied 700 years before. And why did he come? Well, before we get there, we go to the next verse, and it tells even the circumstances that he'd be born in. So at what, what would it be like when Jesus was born? See, we have a way of looking at the chaos in our life, the chaos in our country, the chaos in, in this city, and we think, you know, my life is just kind of, I'm trying to make order out of it all, but, and, and by faith, I want to try to figure it all out. But in Jesus' time, it just seemed when we, we hear preachers talk about it, teachers teach about it, and we see the movie, it just seems like it fits all together. No, it was just as chaotic for Mary and Joseph and everybody that lived around them. In fact, I would, vent, I would say it was more chaotic because they lived as an oppressed people that had been scattered and shattered and had been going on for centuries. One of the most humorous overstatements that the Jews ever made when Jesus was walking around and he said to them the son of man sets you free and you'll no longer be a slave they said we haven't ever been slaves to anyone what a lie for centuries they had been victimized and enslaved by what Assyrians Babylonians Greeks and Romans and they were under Roman rule at the time that they said that they did not have rights like you and I do as Americans at all and then they said that here Micah 700 years before the wave upon wave of persecution says that's the circumstances in which Christ would be born. It would be that Israel would feel like it was that little grandchild abandoned in the bedroom with the door shut, screaming blood-curdling cries. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. The Christ would be born in a very chaotic, oppressive time. And if you wonder if I'm speaking it or exaggerating, speaking the truth, what happened right after the wise men left Bethlehem? Herod, who was sold, a Jewish man, sold out to the Romans, all about his own power. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, the blood of every baby up to two years old spills in your streets. He sent his soldiers there, and they killed everybody that was two years old and under. You can't make this stuff up. Micah told that. 
It would be at a time when Israel, it's like they were abandoned. And yet the Christ was born, and the Messiah is here, and salvation is on the planet for all people because he's born of a woman. And the wise men came, and they gave the gifts, and it's the, the glory of the Christ, and the angels on the day he was born, right? And the singing, the woman has given birth in the town of Bethlehem, the virgin that conceived and bore a child. Those are the circumstances, and Micah, you can't make it up. He said it'd be exactly that. What is this supposed to do? Make us trust in God. But not the kind of trust it's like, you need this first. This is the kind of trust you need at first. This must be real, because you can't make that up. But if that's as far as you get, you're no better than the demons. Jesus' brother James said, the demons believe and they tremble that God is, exists and that he's real. No, what's so beautiful about the story comes in the next passage. It's not just that God exists. It's not just that, uh, oh, uh, we're not just in this atheistic, secular, godless, there is no God. Organ no, there really is a God. It's more than that. The God who sent him is intimately involved in loving and saving you. You as an individual. And if you l read all of the Christmas songs, like Mary, when she found out she was, gonna, she was pregnant with him, Zechariah, who's the father of John the Baptist, Simeon in the temple, these few people that were part of the scattered believers who are around now Jerusalem, who are part of the story, saying, God's love is finally here for us. His deliverance and his peace are ours. Now I'm going to tell you what Zechariah said when he found out John the Baptist was going to be born to his family and he'd be the forerunner of Christ. And then we're going to read the next passage in Malachi. This is what Zechariah says. You are a merciful God and you send your son like the sun coming up after a dark night to the people living in the darkness of chaos and trouble and sorrow. You come and you give them the pathway to peace so they would serve you, God, without fear anymore. By the birth of this child that my son will be the forerunner for. That's what Zechariah said, because he was a man of the Bible. Now let's see what Micah said 700 years before. When this child comes, he will stand and shepherd his flock the strength, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live, the people will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And everybody read this phrase with me. And he will be our peace. This is the proclamation of the meaning of Christmas 700 years before it came. That the Christ would grow up, first in his lifetime, for three years, 30 to 33, demonstrate that he was the shepherd of all people, he would perfectly shepherd. He said to God in his prayer right before he died, I have lost none of those you gave me except the one that was promised that he would betray me. He was a shepherd who didn't lose one sheep. Right? He, was, he was a shepherd to Peter as he went back and got him again and again right after he fell. He was a shepherd to all of his disciples as he came back after he rose from the dead and saw them and gathered them together. He was a shepherd by sending Paul to gather Peter and pull him back. He's been a shepherd of his people the whole time we've known his name. Oh, wait a minute. What was his name? Because it says he will, he will be working in the majesty of the name. Remember what the angel said to Joseph? Your wife's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and don't be bothered looking in any baby books. Don't be thinking about what your daddy's name is. You're not, not going to commemorate God. His name is going to be God saves. That's what Jesus means in their language. Yahweh saves. So Jesus go, walks around in the strength of the name that God saves, saying, I am the Savior of the world. I am the sacrificial lamb. I am the one who's writing everything between you and God. I am your peace with God. I'm your peace in this life, and I'm your peace when it's time to leave. And that's all packed in John 3, 16. As Jesus, the one that would die, said, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave me. Remember Bethlehem? Peace. 
He gave me so that if you would believe in me, you'll not perish. You'll never die. You have a soul, and it'll live on forever, Nicodemus, for eternal life. And Nicodemus experienced a perfect peace. The last phrase, and he will be our peace, is the whole meaning of Christmas. That's why the angels, when they came to the shepherds, and they said, uh, they said the same thing Micah did. Christ is born to you today. They were out in the fields in the city of what? Bethlehem. And he is what? He is Christ the Lord. And then they sang a song. All the multitudes of heaven. And what did they say? Peace on earth. On those on whom God's favor rests. People. God wants you to live in peace. Of all the blessings that you think about as a Christian, all the things as a, as a person of faith that you wonder about, know this. The message of Christmas is I want you to live in peace. I want all of those things that harass you and trouble you and make you anxious. I came to get rid of them. The biggest one is guilt. Every one of us knows ourselves so well and we know that God knows us better that we live in guilt. And he says, I know all of that, and I took it all away. Another big piece is, I want to give you peace that you're able to practice in your relationships that you tend to have so much trouble in. I want you to lay down the arguments and lay down the keeping each other accountable to give you peace of forgiveness. And we bump around, and we need it preached to us again because we get off, right? And we have all these things that are critical in our mind. And we don't even know the message of peace. Because we tend to live by law, and usually it's our own law. But even if we try to live by God's law, we have no peace in relationships. Because trying to get everybody to straighten up around you won't bring peace. What brings peace is forgiveness. It's being a forgiving person toward the people around you, sharing that forgiveness that restores relationships. And he came to bring that. And he modeled it the way he treated his apostles, and he empowers you to do it. You can live in peace right now as the Christmas, in the Christmas spirit, and lay all of your angst about other people aside simply by letting Christ forgive them through you. Just forgive. You forgive your parents, forgive your siblings, forgive your spouse, forgive your kid. Just forgive. Because the Christ has modeled that in forgiving you. That's peace. Now, no more guilt before God. Peace in relationships. That still can't be the only peace because you're still going to face, because sinner that you are, you are still going to face death. Zechariah knew that. He said, we're all living in the shadow of death. David knew that. He's, when he wrote Psalm 23, we're living in the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Every one of us is in the shadow of death. It's going to happen to all of us. We're not here forever. How do you have peace when the fearful thing called death is knocking? Remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross that was experiencing death the same time he was? The one born in Bethlehem can't make it up. The prophecy is true. The one who fulfilled 50 direct prophecies, 250 indirect prophecies, and they all had to do with the sacrifice for your sins so you could go to heaven, said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. The promise of the heaven that Jesus brings is the peace that we have when we face death. Those stories I read to you, I told you about the one that my doctor told me, they really don't, they, the stories are, are fantastic, but they really don't have any stated meaning, do they? This one, you can't make it up. It has the greatest meaning of all. He will be our peace.
Mary, Zechariah, Simeon, they all sang songs at the, around the birth of the Christ that were their Christmas carols. When you enter Christmas now and you're singing the Christmas songs or you're listening to them as you're driving around, remember this. We sing about the peace of Christ because this is the most fantastic, riveting story that anyone will ever experience, and it has the greatest gift that anyone will ever receive. And you have received it. Wrapping Christmas presents, four kids are coming home, and their spouses, and grandkids. Your parents know this. You got multiple children. You're thinking, I hope when they open all this stuff, nobody compares what they got to the other one and thinks that my love is defined by whatever they, you know, the price of the gift or the specialness or the thought that was put in it. Because, goodness gracious, the last thing I want to happen is that while you're trying to give everybody love as you give them a present, is that you would actually create the opposite effect that they feel unloved, right? God has given each of us, no matter what the variation of our life is, the very same wonderful gift. Nobody's left out. He is our peace. Let that be your joy at Christmas. Amen. Let's uh, pray. God in heaven, thank you for showing us again from an old book the wonderful, riveting story of your grace and your son. We love it, and we want it, and we are going to say right now to you that we're going to live in that peace this Christmas season. Nothing can take away what you just gave to us and unwrapped again. And it was a great reminder for me as I studied it, and it was a pleasure for me, Lord, to bring it to your people. Now help us leave here and live in that peace that you promised to be. Amen.